Good afternoon, everyone. Good evening, everyone, from wherever you're joining us. Um, I want to welcome, welcome you to this panel today uh, called Evidence-Based Early Warning for the Prevention of Child Recruitment by Armed Groups. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the panel, just a little housekeeping here. I'll tell you a little bit about the panel and the background. I'll introduce you to the really wonderful panelists that we have joining us today. And then I will try to turn it over to them as quickly as possible so we can hear their really interesting perspectives and experiences in this space. So first, um, let me just introduce myself. My name is Siobhan O'Neill, and I'm the project director for the Managing Exits from Armed Conflict Project, we call it MIAC, um, at UN University Center for Policy Research in New York. Um, and we've been doing work in this space and working with a couple of the fine people on this panel here. So we're excited to have a broader discussion um, with all of you about how to do this type of evidence-based early warning work to prevent child recruitment and use by armed groups. Um, so I'll just give a little background and then I'll turn it over. So just first to say, um, this is obviously an issue that the international community has been mobilized around for over 30 years. And they've been trying to end child recruitment and use by armed groups and by armed forces uh, through legal agreements, through naming and shaming, through direct engagement. And there have been a lot of gains made but we are still very much oriented in a response mode. And we really haven't, in a really effective way, been able to think about prevention. Um, and so today's discussion is really about how to collect the kind of robust evidence uh, and at what level and by whom um, that can be actioned for those types of early warning systems. So I'm, I'm really excited that maybe today we'll make some progress on how to harness evidence at various levels to help end this scourge of child recruitment and use. I'm going to give a little overview of each of our esteemed panelists and tell you a little bit about um, how they'll contribute to this conversation, but I encourage you as I turn the mic over, please, please give us more details and introduce yourself as well. Um, so first I'll have Dr. Catherine ba Bailey Abdi speak. Um, she's the Director of Research and Learning from the Dallaire Institute for Children, Peace and Security. And if you've worked in this space, you know the Dallaire Institute, uh, and you probably know Catherine and her team's work, particularly on the issue of early warning where they've spent the last year plus um, and Catherine will tell us all more about trying to build an early warning system focused on recruitment, recruitment and use of children. And this is part of a much larger set of projects kind of under this umbrella of knowledge for, for prevention, so K4P. So that, that's one perspective that we'll hear from, sort of how to do this more at a national aggregate level. Then I'm very excited to introduce Ms. Angela Olea, who is our local partner, UNUCPR's local partner in Colombia. She's the co-founder and a researcher um, at Conflict Responses Core, uh, which is working on the MIAC project in Colombia. And so in that regard, helping collect ground level data uh, from communities, but also from ex-combatants themselves on issues around indicators around child recruitment and use. So that's one exciting vantage point. But the other one um, to mention in Angela's background is that she's worked with the Ombudsman's Office, which has the mandate for doing this kind of early warning work in Colombia. So I think we can also understand from a state perspective what's happening internally and what's worked well and maybe what hasn't um, worked as well as everybody wants it to. So I think those are two great vantage points to share. Next, we'll have um, Mr. Abdi Karim Hassan, who works as a programs manager at Elman Peace. Um, and again, if you've worked in the space, you know Elman Peace and the amazing work that they've been doing in Somalia. And so Mr. Hassan comes at this from a different perspective. So not necessarily from a research perspective, but from a practitioner perspective and working directly with youth who have been uh, involved in conflict or affected by conflict and is in that kind of programming space and thinking about how practitioners on the ground can play a role in early warning and prevention. So I'm really excited to hear um, his thoughts. So you have these different perspectives. And then we're going to ask Mr. Simon Hills, a technical specialist uh, with the fundamentals department at the ILO to help situate all of these disparate efforts, these efforts at different levels um, and at different, different intervention points and from different vantages to really contribute evidence to, uh, to early warning. We're gonna have Simon take us forward with understanding the context and the context in which 
um, the legal obligations, the mandates, the players uh, who have been mobilized or mandated to actually help prevent child recruitment. So what is the context of sort of the international legal instruments, whether they're specifically on grave violations or they're on, um, they're on forced labor? How do those create the community in which this data can flow and be actioned into something that is preventive. So I think we've got a lot of really interesting perspectives today. Um, and I'm excited to get this contribution from all of them, but also to hear from all of you. So please feel free in the chat function to share your questions. Please tell us who you are and your affiliation, and we'll try to get to as many as possible. Each speaker will talk for about five minutes, and then hopefully we'll save a good chunk of time for discussion and to get to your questions. Um, so I'm going to stop there and welcome Dr. Abdi to, to jump in and really bring us through this really Herculean effort that the Dallaire Institute has undertaken to create this kind of predictive early warning model. So please, Catherine, go ahead. Great. Thanks, Siobhan. Thanks for getting this, this wonderful group. I'm looking forward to learning more from my colleagues today as well. So as Siobhan shared, my name is Catherine Bailey Abity, and I'm coming from the Dallaire Institute for Children, Peace and Security. And the, at the Dallaire Institute, our mission is to progressively end the recruitment and use of, of children. And we do this in a few different ways. We do this by high level advocacy to promote policy and prevention mechanisms strengthening globally. We do this by introducing an, an enhanced capacity building programming with the security sector and communities to improve prevention practices. And finally, we do this by conducting research to inform innovative strategies for preventing recruitment of children. For us at the Dallaire Institute, we believe that prioritizing the prevention of recruitment and use of children is key to sustain peace. And that by prioritizing children, then we will have greater efforts to lasting peace. As everyone tuning in today will know, conflict and violence are great costs in our community and particularly uh, for children. So while the recruitment and use of children in conflict is evolving and a growing glo global issue, reliable and timely information about recruitment is really lacking. We need improved prevention mechanisms, and this was what inspired our Knowledge for Prevention project, or what we call K4P. So in our Knowledge for Prevention project, we're about two years into this program so far. We have three main elements that we're endeavoring to do. One is to produce and create a predictive model for recruitment and use to inform that timely intervention possibility. The second is to look at other systems of early warning and infuse and inform child-centered indicators so that more people are recognizing the importance of children in peace and security. And thirdly, we're endeavoring to bring more researchers and practitioners together and policymakers so that we can collectively share our experiences and our perspectives to improve um, protection mechanisms. We're in the process of completing a study right now exploring how children are considered in early warning. And unfortunately, the findings are showing us that largely they're not being considered at all. There's a glaring lack of consideration for children in the broader peace and security agenda and certainly in early warning systems. Engaging in early interventions of recruitment is where our efforts need to go. We need to be focused at the front end of recruitment and use to prevent it from happening in the first place. And this is why we have really focused on creating an early warning system of, on, focused on prevention. We need timely and effective action, and our early warning must be coupled with the identification of key leverage points for action. For us at the Blair Institute, we look at the complexities of recruitment from many different angles. We look at the basic propensity to even think about recruiting children. So what are those early normalizations that enable the thought of recruitment to take place? Then we look at the emergent recruitment. What are the different pathways to recruitment that we're observing in different contexts and how are they similar and how are they different? And then finally, we look at systematic use. How are children currently being used? How do we anticipate future use? And how does that inform our need to do this prevention work differently? We've developed a predictive model to raise uh, increased 
awareness of the risk of recruitment at an earlier age. And we believe that this predictive model will inform better and more effective prevention measures to protect children, but also to prevent conflict escalation as well. Our early warning system is focused on the likelihood of child soldier use. And currently we're predicting um, correctly at 86% of the time. So 86% we're able to effectively predict the likelihood of recruitment and use. We're currently building our model to be looking at not child soldier recruit. So we're trying to also understand conditions where children are protected and prevented from, from being recruited. And that's equally important. Our prototype model was models were created with AIR and BOMALTS data, and, and we thank them for access to that. And from the use of that data, we were able to confirm four main indicators of significance, although we know there are many more, and we're building data sets now to try and enhance our understanding. Right now, we know that conflict duration matters. The longer a conflict, the more likely children will be engaged in that conflict. Whether a conflict was initiated as a coup or not matters. And again, that really ties back into the time and duration of the conflict. Whether government forces have or continue to use children greatly plays into non-state actor use of children as well. And from our early data, we're suggesting that government use will lead to two times more likelihood of non-state actors using children as well. And then finally, if a non-state armed group it was previously active in a region, that's the fourth indicator that we're observing right now. The data that we've been using is a little dated, so we have created our own non-state armed group data set focused on recruitment and use of children, and we looked at from 2010 to 2020 to, to develop this data set. We are in the process of applying this data set within our models, and we fully anticipate more indicators to be exposed through this process of our analysis. For example, we know that poverty, um, government human rights abuses, and other elements of access to education, parental engagement are indicators that we're looking at as well. The Dallaire Institute's early warning system is embedded in a process that looks at the warning element, but also the response and action element and the politicization in between. So we're looking at what events trigger our assessment and how is our likelihood modeling and the triggered events forming a forecast of risk for children. What we're working on now is trying to work with decision makers to see how our data can inform better and earlier decision making processes and coming up with intervention strategies to share what we believe would be the most effective actions at a certain period to involve that recruitment trajectory. We anticipate that our predictive model will enable us to make predictions around recruitment a year to two years out, so before the recruitment is happening, and we'll be targeting the highest risk areas that our model is, is advising us to, to understand further. From there, the country level predictions will be evaluated with our partners in community. And I think that's really important. And Siobhan alluded to that, the importance of having the macro level big picture analysis, but equally, if not more important, a localized understanding of the context and the contextualized realities of recruitment. So our, our model looks at the merge of the both of the MAC and the community-based assessment. Our early warning system, again, it's really intended to highlight countries where our own organization and our partners need to pay closer attention. We want to raise flags to risk. We want to raise awareness about why recruitment is such an extraordinarily important element in the broader peace and security agenda. Prevention is wide, widely underfunded and preventing recruitment and use is extremely underfunded in the peace and security work. The time to prioritize prevention is now. The time to prioritize children's rights and a sustained peaceful environment for children to grow and develop is now. So just that was a short overview of, of our model, of our work, of our intentions and our goal. And I just wanna thank our community of practice who are engaging over 70 different researchers and practitioners to help advise how we develop our work further. And I thank our, our members as well as our advisory bodies and also our extraordinary data scientist, Tim Lyman, who is a large reason of the success of the development of this model. So I think Siobhan, I'll leave it at that for now, just as 
a bit of a, a quick overview of, of what we're working on and look forward to the continued conversation. Thank you, Catherine. And I know this is definitely going to be um, something that people are going to want to explore more in the conversation. So I'm sure we'll get into it in more detail. But thank you for that really helpful overview. Um, and thanks to your whole team, because I know this is a real group effort, um, all the work that you've done. It's very collaborative and it's wonderful. All right, I'm going to turn it over to Angela to give us two, a two prong perspective, both from the work that MIAC is doing as part of this UNU CPR project, but also her prior experience with the Ombudsman's um, office in, in uh, Colombia. So please, Angela, over to you. Thank you, Siobhan. Um, I'm going to share my screen now. Is that? Okay. Um, just as a starting point of view, uh, I would like to start giving an overview of the early warning system in Colombia. What was the need of having Assad, as we call it, a, at that moment? It was the degradation of the armed conflict during the second half of the 19th, when the, the massacres and the people displaced uh, forces displaced from home was obligated to go to the other cities or go to other municipalities. So the state uh, says we need something, we need a tool to prevent this situation. So in 2001, an alliance of US agencies for international development and the Colombian Ombudsman Office create the program. Then in 2003, it becomes an institutional tool tool for the ombudsman and in 2005 uh, the recruitment became an issue in the early warning system right now uh, what are the entities that are involved in the system mainly the ombudsman because they create uh, the warning report but also the CIPRAT, as we call it that is uh, an intersectorial commission headed by the minister of the interior also, uh, it participates in uh, the Minister of National Defense, the National Protection Unit, military forces, national police, and the unit for attention and reparation of victims. What is the role of this? Uh, the role is to inform, support, and articulate the national identities and the territorial authorities to be a quick and adequate response to the, to the warning. Um, what, what was the methodology that they use uh, and right now they are using? So the SAT is defined as an instrument for collecting, verifying, and analysis in a technical way information relate, related with situation of vulnerabilities and risk of the civilians as a consequence of the armed group uh, conflict. Sorry. So they have four steps uh, to do that. The first one is to focalize the territories or zones that require special attention uh, according with the information that they, they have in the ground. Uh, to do that, so they go to the second step that is monitoring daily, that is an activity that they do daily, uh, receiving, verifying, and recording information for, from communities, local institutions, social organizations. With this, they, they, they create the warning report. That could be three kind of different warning reports. One is the situational report. Um, the other one is the monitoring notes. And the third one is the imminent risk report. What is the different, different between this? Uh, it depends on the probability of this risk occurs into the community and how fast this could occur. So, uh, the monitoring notes is related with the four steps, that is the following of the state answers, taking into account the risk evolution, of course, and the institutional responses, uh, not just the national, but also the local response. They have something called the CISAT, the, that is the system uh, information, where all these monitoring protocol uh, where they have a registration form, a check sheet, a commission report, a monitoring sheet, uh, goes to the CSAT and they uh, create the mapping uh, where they show the, the risk and also uh, they create the warnings. So they, they create these documents um, and also create the special reports. That are, that those special reports are important for our topic because 
here is where they go to the uh, goes to think about the recruitment. So indicators for monitoring, warming, and pre uh, prevention of children recruitment and use by army groups focusing this, this, uh, these three types of dimensions. Uh, that is uh, the type of recruitment, the recent threats, and uh, the vulnerability factors that they, they, they have. How this dialogue with our managers exit uh, from um, uh, armed conflict project, the MEAC project seeks to enhance our understanding of how and why individual exit armed groups and in which uh, intervention support full and sustainable transition to civil life. To this end, MEAC has worked across the UN to create an agreed assessment framework and an accompanying toolkit to support robust integrated assessment at every stage of the programming cycle. MEAC tools currently being pilot tested in Nigeria and Colombia collect data in all aspects of individual association with the armed groups of force, including of, on nature of their recruitment or association. In addition to this data from associated individual, MEAC conducts community surveys, which also capture reports of child recruitment and use by armed groups. This kind of level data taken, taken together is providing real-time evidence to support prevention and reintegration of efforts in this context. With the uh, Colombian pilot, planet work with former associated individuals coming through reintegration, reincorporation, and criminal groups programming. The current community survey is tested in 11 municipalities with 1,500 person samples, with some interesting uh, topics in this area. The reintegration of the FAR within implementation of the peace agreement, uh, the continuous activity of uh, armed groups or dissident groups, including a specific effort efforts targeting the children, climate change, environmental degradation, and security. Also, dynamics around, around presence of uh, Venezuelan migrants and refugees. And of course, the instrumentalization of the impact of the COVID-19. Some preliminary findings that we have is knowledge of past child recruitment was reported in all 11 municipalities, 25% of the total sample. This was as high as 44% uh, in the in La Uribe Meta, where the former FAR guerrilla was traditionally, and down to uh, 13 in Bogotá. Also, knowledge of children child recruitment was reported in all uh, 11 in municipalities, 8% uh, of the total sample. This was as high as 15 in San Jose del Guaviare and as close as 2% in Bogotá. So, how, why and how this data collection? This data augments the current capacities, capacities and effort in Colombia, especially because the current difficulties to report about child respect, taking into account new forms of recruitment and use by armed or criminal groups. Uh, also, the data and uh, child recruitment in context were identified where we are identifying relationships and details, such as what time of the uh, communities, uh, what are the dynamics that overlap with this recruitment. For example, low say climate change, deforestation, or me, uh, Venezuelan migrants. And finally, uh, GAO, which means the criminal group surveys, is an opportunity to understand the difference in people who until now had no access to the DDI process and who do child recruitment and use. So this gives us an emphasis, an empirical basis to create a hypothesis and a baseline for this kind of process. And I will leave it in that, Shivan. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Angela. And thanks for sharing some of those early findings about the evidence of child recruitment that are only a week old. So um, it's exciting to be able to share those with everybody now and, and talk through how this can be done at different levels. Um, I'm excited now to turn to our next speaker, um, Mr. Abdi Karim Hassan, who will talk from the Somalia experience um, and from a programmatic perspective on, on how to potentially do this work um, when you have that particular vantage point. So Abdi Karim, I turn it over to you, please. Uh, thank you, uh, Siobhan, and my panelists. A uh, very good evening to you all. Um, my name is Abdi Hassan Mohammed. I work with the uh, Elman Peace Center here, here in Somalia. And uh, as already Siobhan has touched on, we work with uh, youth and uh, children affected by armed conflict. Uh, to give you a little bit of a background in Somalia, I think uh, many of you know Somalia has uh, faced a protracted conflict for over uh, 30 years now. Uh, that's almost my, 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 my age. Uh, suddenly, uh, here at Elman, we focus on uh, um, providing assistance to these children uh, that has been, you know, faced with uh, uh, the challenge of growing up in an environment which is uh, suddenly challenging. Um, however, the context-wise of the country, you know, there is a limited policy and legal frameworks for preventing the use of children. And uh, we have, um, you, know, um, you know, armed conflict, armed groups that are, you know, perpetrating this grave violation. And, uh, you find that, uh, you know, the li limited government uh, control in many of the places where such children are living uh, is uh, hampering the government's efforts and the international donors' effort to uh, provide assistance to these children. Uh, the armed group here in, in Somalia, known as Al Shabaab, controls uh, large swathes of land and. Uh, no, very limited knowledge is known of what uh, the status of uh, such children in those spaces. Uh, there is uh, a lot of limited focus uh, of the country, you know, in terms of prevention, and you find the donor community focused on more on hard security as a means of deterrence rather than focusing on a prevention which is more of a developmental and uh, and requires a long-term uh, goal. Uh, at Elman, we work with the two streams of children. Uh, one, we receive handovers from government. Of, uh, government. These are children that have been you know, already involved with armed, for, armed forces uh, that have been captured in the front lines or have left the group. Uh, you'll find that uh, recruitment in Somalia, you know, uh, the, the push and pull factors are, are quite wide and I won't go much deep into it. However, one uh, common theme that comes out of, uh, of this is uh, poverty and, you know, finding um, um, some means of, of, of connection with the armed groups. Uh, you know, a place, a country where, you know, infrastructure, basic infrastructure has been dismantled over the, the protracted conflict for uh, these long years. And, uh, and uh, state institutions are not able to provide the much needed uh, services for uh, al Shabab uh, per se, providing small services, even for small job creations, uh, finds, uh, you know, uh, uh, a pulling factor for youth and children uh, in this in these spaces. Um, we also do have a large programs for children. Uh, we call them, you know, at risk, and uh, and uh, for recruitment into armed forces. And uh, there are indicators or uh, early warning uh, indicators, call them, that we look into uh, for these children for us to be able to register them into our programs and help them uh, uh, forge a path towards you know becoming self-independent and not be used by armed forces uh, these uh, indicators among others because you know in, include uh, you know displaced to children children separated from their families children fleeing with their parents from conflict zones uh, sadly in, in somalia we have uh, conflicts within the clan system you know that erupts or show up attacking a, a community or, or or a village just because those communities refuse to hand over children uh, that will be uh, put into you know the ranks of of of, of the foot soldiers of of the the, the, the armed group. So you find uh, you know a lot of uh, traffic of children moving in and out of uh, most of uh, these uh, these uh, uh, communities and uh, and places. So it is uh, this uh, movement of one place from another of children you know with their caregivers without their caregivers and separation that. Uh, uh, recruitment is, is, is very high. Uh, a simple thing like, you know, um, an, immediate, an immediate family who is within the armed group is a, is a very uh, clear one 
system that such child is going to end up with, with the armed forces should uh, he not get the preventive measures that he requires. You find early uh, one issues such as discrimination, you know, seeking vengeance, finding alternative job placement, lack of school, lack of education, drug abuse, uh, orphans, you know, with a lack of caregivers. These are all, you know, warnings that uh, tell us that such child requires uh, assistance. In order for us to, you know, uh, get deeply into understanding these dynamics, we work closely with important uh, actors across uh, the wider community. Uh, they include the clan elders who understand the fabrics of, 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 of the, 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 the community and the clans. You have to understand that uh, Somalia, uh, as they dismantle, you know, the, 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 the the basic institutions dismantled, the only institution that remained over the 20 years that provided some sort of protection for the, the, for the basic Somali has been the clan. So the clan has uh, sways of, of, of power, you know, it, it, it collects uh, money from, 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 from the members of the clan and uh, it's some sort of a protection. So they understand what's going on within the clan. Uh, if someone wants to understand who Abdi is today, that they will need to know is what my clan is for them to be able to track me. So this clan system has been very important and clan elders have played a very big role in understanding whose child and whose children is at the risk of being uh, recruited into, into armed forces. And we have a system of collaborating them through this uh, clan, uh, clan community focal that help us identify such children. We work with uh, religious leaders that help us, you know, uh, you know, inform us which child has been, you know, brainwashed uh, and uh, oftentimes religion is being used as a, as a means, you know, to inform the children that uh, their country is being invaded vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, these issues, foreigners have invaded, they need to take arms to, to defend their countries. Those rhetorics are the things that also religious leaders help us to identify, and so at least we can be able to uh, identify such youth and uh, reach them before uh, armed forces reach them into their recruitment cells. Uh, we also work with the grassroots uh, women organizations. Uh, mothers are, you know, the, 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 the soft part of our society and they really uh, uh, form very important uh, uh, working collaborations with us to uh, ensure that the children are, 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 are within safe zones. Uh, fathers and uncles, and they, they are quite busy, you know, uh, trying to find a bread for, for, for the family. And most often here, the culture is that uh, mothers do stay behind to, to take care of their children. And so we've tapped into that uh, cultural aspect of our society to be able to inform mothers that, you know, this, if you see your child uh, portraying this, uh, these kinds of behaviors, you know, uh, info, you know, going with uh, this and being that, being this, that they should be able to, you know, seek help so that at least their child can be uh, provided with the necessary. We work with youth groups. We have uh, since 1990 worked uh, uh, although the dynamics of the conflict have changed. In the 90s, 90s, you had the clan elders forcing children into, you know, their clan, you know, interests. However, came into the early uh, 2006 uh, to up until now, the dynamics has changed into terrorism and, you know, armed groups with uh, different ideologies. So we work with youth groups and since uh, 2005, uh, Elman has uh, been, uh, uh, you know, happy to provide almost over a thousand youth with the uh, alternative pathways to be able to reintegrate into the society. So these youth groups have formed, uh, you know, an, a mentorship uh, for children, other children who want to, you know, have such pathways. So we have these children who uh, form, you know, mentorship programs and uh, they also work within the communities and help us to identify children who are uh, at risk. And uh, important, uh, you know, in this early identification of these risk factors that I've, I've identified is, is response. And uh, this is key to the prevention and in order, in order to help prevent such vulnerable children from being used into, you know, suicide bombs and, uh, and other, other vices, then providing the necessary education skills and opportunities and absolute necessity in this context. And they're giving them, you know, a basic thing like vocational skill training in electricity will help them, you know, place them in a job that they can be able to feel secure uh, rather than, you know, seek uh, a job placement that will end, will end them uh, wearing a suicide belt. Equally, the above uh, factors are key to our advocacy strategies that uh, you know, help us nurture the narrative to counter the armed group's narrative so that they uh, stop preventing uh, uh, the use of children in armed conflict. Um, there are challenges in this context 
you know, working in the practitioner approach towards ending the recruitment, the recruitment of children has its own uh, challenge. We, there is a lack of uh, political buy-in and decision-making for policymakers to be able to put into this early warning system that we have uh, so far uh, documented into the policymaking is always challenging. You find that uh, there is a lack of enough data and research that uh, to inform the decision, the things that we've already gathered. And we're very happy with the, the Delay Institute, you know, working closely with them to at least understand what works best in other areas so that at least we can uh, best be informed. Um, you will find that uh, working in this context also uh, is there's a very limited resources and uh, the commit, committing needs, uh, competing needs of the society, you know, oftentimes they limit the assistance provided to the prevention of uh, children in armed conflict. And, uh, Prevention is, is, is a long run, it's not a quick fix. It requires systemic sustainable uh, donor funding, which oftentimes is, is a challenge. So gaps in fund, uh, financing projects are a challenge of not reaching the, 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 the children needed. However, there are opportunities that uh, uh, we look forward to, you know, in terms of the early warnings and prevention. The objective, you know, to have a clarity in the objective of uh, what we need, we're trying to achieve is always uh, important. An early warning or timely response, you know, achieving a consensus around the objective is critical to the success. The objective is always to prevent children uh, being used, and that will help the overall community security, uh, the security of the community. We understand that so the objective is always once these children are helped, that the community uh, uh, will be able to uh, and, and get the necessary the peace that uh, they require and peace will be, uh, dividends will be achieved. Uh, increasing also the buy-in from relevant actors. We have, uh, you know, working with the, the grassroots community leaders for us has been very successful. And uh, that is a very, uh, you know, uh, opportunity for, for practitioners who are engaged in this field to understand how they can be able to work with uh, the, the, the grassroots lead. So, and also, one other important opportunity is, uh, you know, getting the shift to action, you know, uh, instead of uh, putting emphasis into, into you know, uh, the early warning system itself, it's also best to also work closely to see how uh, action is needed to prevent, you know, engaging with the peace, act, uh, peace uh, processes. Those people who are uh, in here in Somalia, we have Amisom, and uh, I, 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 I wouldn't be surprised if these conversations of early warnings is not embedded within their, their structures of uh, commandment. And uh, lastly, but not the least, the issue of gender has always been a question asked in many of our uh, conversation with the world we have very limited understanding of the dynamics of gender. We do, however, have seen so many women and girls involved with armed conflict. However, the engagement in this uh, and their role has always been a challenging to, to understand. I want to rest my case here. However, I'm open to uh, answer any questions that are. Siobhan, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Abdi Karim. And everyone will know that Abdi Karim is um, trained in, in law. So that was a very excellent sort of way to wrap us up there. I appreciate it. And I think that the, some of the points you brought will really come through, I hope, in the discussion section about um, gender, obviously, that the right sort of um, entry points for leverage in particular communities. I think you really highlighted who can be useful in that regard. Um, and I think some interesting sort of discussions about thinking about vulnerability and thinking about prevention and sort of how those things overlap or differ and how you how you approach them. So thank you for that very rich contribution. I'm now going to turn it over to Mr. Simon Hills, who has the unenviable job of sort of situating all of this very rich content from very different perspectives in context, um, in the context of, of um, the norms against child soldiering and this sort of extreme forms of child labor, the worst forms of child labor and grave violations against children to understand sort of legal obligations, the different players in this space, their mandates. So we can start to edge towards, you know, evidence um, and positioning, but actually to action. And so um, I'm gonna turn it over to Simon to give us some context to situate all of those rich contributions. And so Simon, please over to Thanks. you. Thanks, Siobhan. Um, yeah, not necessarily the easiest of tasks, but there is, despite conflict and war seeming sometimes lawless and, and out of control, there are norms and standards which have been created over many, many years in terms of engagement and what should happen. And even when it doesn't, there are means of redress to, to um, challenge and, and means of redress against that. So 
all these exist. We have the Geneva Conventions coming out of World War II. And, and since then, the definitions and work and those relevant to prevention of child soldiers have grown. Um, obviously, we have Catherine here from, from Dallier Institute, who were key in um, bringing about the Vancouver Principles from 2017, which are some of the most recent, looking at the peacekeeping and prevention of recruitment and use of child soldiers. Um, so that's one of the most recent ones. Another recent one has been the Safe Schools Declaration of 2015. Again, looking at protecting children, making sure schools are not um, attacked or used as recruitment centers within conflict, which gives uh, children safe spaces so they're less vulnerable to being recruited, etc. Um, we have the Paris Principles on uh, children and armed forces and armed groups from 2007. And then even before that, you have the Convention Rights on the Child um, optional protocol, um, uh, including child soldiers and use of that from 2000 and 2002. Um, so you have all these legal mechanisms, which may seem convoluted at times, but they are there and they nation states are held accountable to them. Coming from the ILO, we're much more interested, say, in labor standards and what this means for labor. So the issue of child soldiers and child recruitment isn't necessarily our focus, but it's definitely part of the work that we do. Um, and a lot of the work, one of the areas of work that ILO has done a lot on uh, and has been leading light on has been on child labor, as mentioned. Uh, and this has been going on for decades. One key convention as well is Convention 138 of the ILO on minimum age of work, which sets boundaries for what type of work uh, children can engage in, what age they can engage in work, and it's up to member states to ratify and follow these. And this is a fundamental principle of the ILO. So obviously hazardous and dangerous work is covered within that, and obviously forced recruitment and recruitment and involvement in um, armed conflict would not uh, qualify. Um, and then more recently in 1999, we had the launch of Convention uh, 182 against the worst forms of child labor. And this specifically talks about um, our children in armed conflict. Um, it talks about amongst other areas of the worst forms of child labor, the abolition of all forms of slavery uh, and um, including forced and compulsory recruitment of children for use in armed conflict. Um, it also talks about hazardous work, work which by its nature or circumstances uh, in which it is carried out is likely to harm the health, safety or morals of children. So again, these are explicitly mentioned in the ILO conventions. And um, last year in 2020, uh, Convention 182 received universal ratification by all ILO member states, meaning every single member state of the ILO has signed Convention 182, meaning that they are responsible and upholding the elimination of the worst forms of child labor. Um, linked to that, another model, which is more maybe development based than, than is thought of possibly within a conflict lens is the Sustainable Development Goals or SDGs. Um, under that, we have SDG 8, which is looking at decent work and decent work for all. However, within that, it's decent work obviously is about good conditions, but it's also the, about the elimination of harmful and dangerous conditions. So under target 8.7 of SDG 8, um, the target is to take immediate and effective measures to eradicate forced labor, end modern slavery and human trafficking, and secure the prohibition and elimination of the worst forms of child labor, including recruitment and use of child soldiers, and by 2025, end child labor in all its forms. So as you can see, the world has signed up and the SDGs have signed up for eliminating child soldiers and child recruitment by 2025, which is an extremely ambitious goal. However, it should be applauded for including it. And this is what we should be working for. So there are all these targets within Alliance uh, SDG 8.7. There is now a group called Alliance 8.7, which is trying to take this um, target forward and ensure that we achieve it or make as much progress as we can by the deadline set out by the um, SDGs. And also within the UN, this year, 2021, is the international year for the elimination of child labor, which obviously includes the recruitment and use of child soldiers. Um, so there are all, all these other um, international obligations and activities going on, which link into this um, issue of 
child recruitment and the prevention of um, recruitment and use of child soldiers. Um, so hopefully that also gives a grounding for where and how the work that's been discussed all around fits in with, um, with the examples we've seen. And hopefully that also gives a bit more of a framework for the questions that hopefully will be uh, asked by all of you. Thank you, Simon. That's a great segue just to say to our um, audience, if you have a question, please, please enter into the chat. And if you could tell us um, who you are, if your name's not visible and your sign in, but your name and, and what affiliation you have, that would be great. We're getting lots of requests for tools, but it'd be great to have some of your questions. Um, maybe I'll start us off with one while we're waiting for others to come through. And I think one of the things that's interesting in listening across your interventions was how to get this balance right. Um, the balance of, you know, sort of aggregated level data. So, and the balance of sort of ground level or really tailored context specific data. So hearing some of the examples from Somalia and Colombia um, of a very specific vulnerability um, components that you're identifying with young people that you're working with, whether it's migration, whether it's displacement or separation from family, um, and then thinking about some of the work that MIAC is doing in Colombia, specifically on certain intersections, whether it's climate change and man-made degradation of the environment and recruitment or Venezuelan migrant children and recruitment. So thinking about those very context-specific elements, and then thinking back to those four main indicators that Catherine was talking about and looking across context. Um, so I'd love to hear people talk about that balance if, if anyone wants to address that question. And maybe also another element of balance is really about do we need child recruitment specific early warning tools or is this a component of something larger? And if we think about sustainability, how do we get that balance right so that we are actually capturing what we care about but we actually would have sustainable resources and buy-in for, for supporting it. So I'll turn it over to the panel. If anyone wants to jump in on any of those issues, please just, you can even just physically wave and, and jump right in. Any takers? Go ahead, Angela, please. I'm going to start with the second question, and it, it has to be like a specific topic, topic inside the system. And I think if it is not a specific topic, at least it has to be something transversal and that is integrated to all the stages of the system of the, in a early warning. Uh, otherwise, this could be like just special reports that you create a, a, certain times um, with that, with a, I, I don't know, like a timing that no normally comes with the daily monitoring. And in that way, you cannot uh, recreate these cha uh, changes in the ground that usually are very, very fast, the changing. So uh, if, if, if it is not like a specific topic, at least it has to be something transversal all the time. Catherine, do you want to jump in coming from the different a different sort of 30,000 foot view and, and give us another perspective? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, Angela. I think it's so important to have that regional contextual analysis. I, I think it depends on who your audience is and who you're trying trying to move. And so I think that's why the, the beauty of having collaboration on assessment is so important. So we can have that very localized understanding of the nuance and the different indicators and, and vulnerabilities. But having that broader global look uh, is, is important for a set of policymakers at a different, in a different way. So we can look from region to region what the risks are. And when we're looking at global protection mechanisms, that'll help inform a, a broader um, intervention or a way forward. So I think it's not the either or, it's how do we ensure that people working at the community level and at sort of the global level are teaching and learning with each other so that we can improve both systems because they're both important and they serve slightly different purposes. And sorry, if I can just on a second question quickly about children versus a more general early warning. We have many early warning systems on conflict and they look at different elements. We continue to fail to address children 
and looking at children's needs and children's engagement and participation in, in sustainable peace. And so I appreciate the recognition that resources are slim, they're rarely in prevention and they're rarely with children and prevention, but it's such an important element for us to start to recognize why children are so important in this space. And until that is accepted, I do think there needs to be a targeted specific look at children and children. Thank you both for those very, I think, um, interesting sort of views on both of those sort of balance components. Um, maybe there's a there's a component that came through this so far, which is really the big the big question here, which is how do you I mean, there's how do you collect robust evidence or um, that recruitment is happening and then how do you action it? And I think several of you touched on this in your interventions, whether it was about who has mandates or who has at least in theory signed on to this or who is the right entry point for, you know, dealing with different vulnerable individuals. Um, you know, where is their political will or maybe where isn't there? So it would be wonderful to have panelists um, jump in to the extent they can on some of their experience here, what they've learned, Catherine, and some of the work that you've done. I think that would be really interesting to hear where you think this works well into shifting from evidence to action. I think we're all trying to be polite. Maybe if it's okay, I'll, I'll go quickly and then my colleagues uh, can jump in. But I, I think this is, the, this is the real heart of the question and this is where the real complexity comes. And, you know, my colleagues and I were talking about climate change. I think most of us in evidence-based science work know the, the data and the figures about climate change, but the action hasn't followed. So how do we can have all of the best evidence and action isn't guaranteed. So how do we motivate people to see the relevance of acting? And, and I think having the ability to have different lenses apply is really important. So applying a, a, an economic, political economic analysis, what is the cost of not intervening and not preventing recruitment? versus the cost of doing it. And applying different lenses to speak to these different audiences is really key. Something that's been working for us at the Delaire Institute, working with security actors, is really leveraging past experience of um, senior officers who have seen firsthand the impact of recruitment, maybe have lived it themselves, um, and that being a driving motivation for creating change for their children or grandchildren in a particular context. So I think there are so many angles uh, that we can try and learn from in terms of, of creating action, but it's really, that's, that, that's the most complex part, the transition from the warm to, to effective action. Thank you. Simon, do you wanna jump in here? Not so much, not on this one. I think I think the examples uh, and experience that uh, Abdi Karim and Angela have are far more relevant here in terms of uh, dealing directly with it. Abdi Karim, do you want to jump in? Absolutely, and I also saw a question on the chat box. Uh, you know, uh, mentioning the the issue of trends and in terms of uh, the recruitment of uh, children. And Juliet, thank you for that question. Uh, he, the trend in Somalia has uh, changed over the last uh, two years. Before we used to have, uh, you know, recruitment self of, of the groups, you know, targeting specific vulnerable children, you know, to add them into their cells. However, of recently, they have started forcing parents, you know, to give up their children and, uh, and or even forcing the clans, you know, to give up their children. Otherwise, you know, they face their repercussions such as, you know, uh, seizing of, of their property, the property belonging to, to, to the clan. You find that uh, parents who refuse to hand off their children are, are, are targeted. Some of them are killed. And uh, they have also resorted to kidnapping, uh, kidnapping children. And uh, well, there's, the trend keeps on changing. And uh, they always, you know, some of them you find uh, the armed groups quite sophisticated with technology, targeting children over, you know, miles and miles away you find uh, children as young as 17 16 coming from the u.s you know to come and uh, fight uh, wars that they were not uh, you know they didn't have anything to say so the issue of technology that uh, that they are trying 
to use, you know, with the, so many encryptions that uh, none of us can uh, can understand that uh, such level of sophistication. So there's so many moving parts and, uh, that uh, that are dynamic, and I agree with uh, with what uh, Dr. Catherine has said that uh, we need to place, you know, children in 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 the in the past and in terms of policy, you know, how do we engage the decision makers in order for them to prioritize. Uh, such uh, such uh, such issues. I will conclude by saying data is very important and uh, investment is uh, the way to go. You know, if uh, the international community focuses on investing into data, so at least we can best be informed. That will go a long way. Over. Thank you, Siobhan. Thank you so much. We're coming close to the end of our session and. Um... Talissa, our, our technical support has kindly said that we could go a few minutes over. So I want to give each of the panelists a moment to respond to either of the questions, really about moving from evidence to action, um, or to respond to Catherine's comments on that, or to answer the second question. And the second question comes um, from uh, one of our participants, Juliette Gallo uh, Corelli, who's asking if there's been a shift in trends on armed groups' behavior and methods of recruitment. Abdi Karim just talked a little bit about that, um, and uh, some other issues around sort of data here. So I know Simon wants to come in on this issue as well. So I'll turn it to him to start. But if any of the panelists want to have a last word on either topic, please feel free. So go ahead, Simon. Thanks, Siobhan. Yeah, no, data is very, very difficult. Um, for the ILO, we do quite a lot of work on data collection, economic trends, before surveys, etc. And every four years, we do the global trends on child labour, which are coming out on June 10th this year, looking at the overall situation in terms of child labour. Uh, and so the focus is not on child soldiers, but this is a massive undertaking and getting robust data uh, is a challenge and it costs a lot of money. Um, the other issue as well, especially in terms of child soldiers, conflict is extremely dynamic happens very quickly and can often move on. So trying to keep up and have robust data, I'm talking about statistics which are gonna be collected from 2019 for this 2021 report. So already we've missed out most of what's happened in COVID within this child labor report, although there has been some updates there. Um, but you can imagine for conflict, so much is lost so quickly. Uh, and if you're dealing with old figures, it's not going to be as relevant. Um, but there are is some information there. So this is where a lot of the challenges around data are. But having having systems which are in place, which can be dynamic and can co collect on a more local level is very useful and is a lot easier to do than, as I say, these sort of massive global efforts which take place. And then again, with not so much data, but reporting every year as well, you have the um, special representative for the Secretary General's office on um, children and armed conflict, who release a paper specifically looking at 15 major um, countries where children and armed conflict is occurring and seeing how that situation is, is progressing or not, as the case may be. I think that will be out later this year as well. So there is some data, but in terms of concrete data and reliable data, especially when you're dealing with illicit activities, fast moving situations, conflict where it's not always known what side is is doing what and everything else. It, it's very hard to necessarily have the, the robust and, and um, data immediately available to, to work with. In leading a very large project on, on changing how robust and comparable our data is in this space, I, yes, I'm very um, empathetic to some of these questions. So um, let me just turn it over to the other panelists, um, Angela, Abdi Karim, and Catherine for a last word. Go ahead, please. Yes, um, I was thinking of the question of Juliette and just to refer in this kind of uh, transformation that the groups are doing uh, between the recruitment itself, uh, that is taking a child from home and put it into the, into the group and other kind of uses that they can, uh, they, they can do against the, the children. Uh, so they don't need, they, they identify that they, it's easier for them if they don't take it from home, they leave it, they don't take it from school, uh, but also they use it in, in different activities uh, inside the group. Uh, because it was the first alert that, that we were seeing that if someone is not going to the school, it's because something is happening at home. If someone is not focused at the school, it's because probably he's doing summer stuff. 
for the for the for the groups. So that was a change. It's not so recent, I have to say, but it, it, that was a change. And the other one is uh, the relationship between the policy and the the group itself. So now um, the policy into in, inside the group. Now what we are seeing in Colombia, for instance, is that uh, the, the groups are no uh, asking them to be part of, of just the group, like a like in front of the group to do a work, but they are they, they are offering uh, stuff like being in a high rank with money. So those kind of things it, it's very very recently, but those kind of things are some changes that we are seeing inside the group. Um, and just to, to to talk about what Catherine said about the, the the how to articulate from the ground and the politics, I was thinking that. Probably, uh, what the, the implication of the politics is not just uh, it's, it's not just uh, like thinking in like in sections, but you need to involve different institutions. Uh, you need to involve uh, those institutions that are all the time thinking in, in in children, but also the institutions that are thinking about environmental stuff. And normally, they don't speak. Thanks, Angela. Abdi Kareem, one minute left. Do you want? Do you have any last words on either of these issues? Um, I think Shovan, much has been said uh, by our panelists, and uh, so much has been learned. So I just rest my case and say it's been a pleasure uh, being here. Over. Thank you so much. And Catherine, I'll give you the last word. Thanks, Shovan. I think the importance, and Angela's touched on it, just collaboration and being innovative and seeing opportunity for collaboration where maybe we haven't seen it before. And I think that's the only way we'll have effective prevention and have sustained data is if we're, we're willing to learn from colleagues who have a slightly different mandate than maybe how we see ourselves. So collaboration is, is really key. I think that's a wonderful note to end on. Um, it's also a great re re reason to thank um, NYU uh, CIC for hosting this because this is indeed the kind of forum where we can come together and think about ways to collaborate and bring all of these great organizations and individuals who are doing great work um, on this topic together. So I think this is a great moment and transition. And I think it's the collaboration, not only on the evidence collection, but also from a really, um, systemic approach to the response, right? Uh, we have different mandates, we have different vantage points, different capacities, sometimes different contradictions within those. And if we come together in, in communities, we're likely to be more effective. So it's a two prong sort of collaborative approach. And I'm, I'm hopeful that this conversation that we've had today helps advance that further. I know we've gotten a couple last questions in um, just as we're wrapping up and we'll try to follow up bilaterally, but thank you to all of you who've attended. Um, thank you to our speakers, thank you to their organization for the great work that they're doing in this space. And again, thank you to Calissa and uh, NYU. So thanks so much, everyone. Have a good day.